Well, good morning, everybody. I hope you had a good uh, coffee break. Uh, we're about to start our next next session. My name is Marianne Turnsek. I am from the CDC in Atlanta, Georgia. But today I am here to uh, present on behalf of the GTFCC our vision for laboratory training. Uh, after I present the vision, I hope we have some time to discuss what's presented. We'd like to hear your feedback and thoughts uh, on what we have planned. Um, so, so throughout the presentation, you might see some questions on the slides. They're not meant to be addressed during, during the presentation, but at the end of the presentation, we'll have an opportunity to talk about some of those things. Let's begin. Okay, so for background, I just want to, I wanted to take a moment and put this into the context of the roadmap. So training, laboratory training is relevant for access one and access two. And I think we heard that from a couple of speakers yesterday, including Marie Lore. Um, so laboratory training relates to early det access one, early detection and response to contain outbreaks and access two, targeted multi-sectoral approach to prevent cholera reoccurrence. The laboratory is engaged in both of those axes. And I just wanted to remind everyone of the uh, surveillance and reporting uh, objective, which is effective routine surveillance and laboratory capacity at the peripheral level to confirm suspected cases, inform the response, and track progress towards control and elimination. Very relatable to the laboratory. So I wanted to now talk about what training resources are available on the GTFCC site. Currently, we have job aids and fact sheets on rapid diagnostic testing, AST, isolation identification uh, from stool culture, from, from stool samples, uh, specimen transport and packaging, strain conditioning. There are technical guidelines available on the GTFCC site that covers uh, the new surveillance guidance. That's a resource. Uh, most of these resources now are available in both English and French. Yeah. Um, the uh, technical guidelines cover the new adaptive uh, testing strategy, and there are reporting guidance and templates available online. And what the graphics that you see on the left are just two examples, two job aids um, on uh, the first one to the uh, far left is the uh, isolation and identification workflow. This is a one page document that laboratories can print out and pop, put it right up on that wall when they're doing the testing as a reminder of what the workflow is. Uh, the other one is uh, for uh, 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 specimen transport, how to collect specimens and then properly transport them. And it goes into quite a lot of detail, which, which uh, option is perhaps better for downstream, subsequent uh, downstream testing. Some are better than others for PCR or um, culture-based testing. So if you haven't already checked these out, definitely check them out. And just for curiosity, did you guys know that these were available on the GTFCC website? Hands for anyone who might have gone there? Okay, awesome. I see about four or five hands. Good. Okay, so definitely check them out. I'll ask again next year, and I want to see everybody's hand go out. Okay, so we have some, here's where we want to go in future. We want to develop a laboratory training package, and this will be standardized materials that will include things like presentations that you can 
you can go and give in your laboratory. Uh, there'll be training plans, a checklist of what you will need for training, whether it's hands-on or uh, uh, lecture-based, all, all kinds of resources will be there. And the final package will be made available uh, via the GTFCC website and um, online training courses uh, available open WHO. Okay. Um, and as mentioned, well, as alluded to, laboratories and stakeholders can access and use these materials as needed. No need, no special password. You just go there, you take what you want and, and use them in your in-house laboratory training. So here's that first question to think about and we'll come back to it at the end of the presentation. What else? Uh, would you like to see perhaps in that training package or how else could the G, how else can GTFCC uh, support laboratory trainings? Okay, so the benefits of laboratory training, I have to talk, talk about this just a little bit. First and foremost, it builds capacity for lab confirmation, which in turn improves the ability to inform decision-making, which is key, our, our key objective here. But within the lab, it promotes accuracy and consistency for testing and reporting results. Um, it supports the development of the staff and increases the competence and the confidence in your staff. Um, it improves the uh, preparedness and response for when the time comes uh, when you are potentially facing an outbreak. And it improves the overall quality of the test system. You might be training for cholera, but you're learning technique about quality assurance, uh, media preparation. There's, there's benefits that go beyond cholera when you're doing laboratory training. And, um, and not only is there more confidence internally, externally, your uh, partners uh, have better confidence in your results when they see the effort being made by the laboratory for uh, to improve the overall capacity. So what are the key training topics? Um, so first and foremost, it's cholera basics. And this is what is cholera? Uh, the, describing the disease, describing the pathogen, describing what a cholera response is. And this, this can be, a, uh, the context for this type of presentation can be very broad or very specific depending on your audience. When it's laboratory, you might wanna focus more on the pathogen and the methodology. But if you have other uh, pillars uh, there, you might wanna be a little broader. And, and I think it's a good idea to share information about the diagnostics with the epidemiologist and with the clinicians. So they have a better idea of why it takes 48 hours to 72 hours to have a laboratory result. You know, we just can't like pop it out 24 hours later, it takes time. Um, so in addition to those cholera basics, you know, specimen collection, preservation and transport, uh, the adaptive testing strategy that you've heard quite a bit about uh, the last few days, rapid diagnostic tests, not only how to use it, but contextual information about when and why and the strategy for testing. Um, the primary isolation of Vibrio cholerae from stool specimens. So that's very labby, that's how we call it. You know, that's when you're in there talking about you're, you're using a loop, you, you've got your plates, but um, um, it's, it's in some circumstances, like I said, it's good to, it may be not the hands-on part of the primary isolation methodology, but the overall workflow, having the other pillars, having some awareness of what we are doing in the lab to isolate and identify cholera can be a good thing in some circumstances. Um, it's always fun to see an epi with a pipette in their hand or a loop in their hand too. I always kind of have a little joke about laugh, laugh about them. They look so cute. Um, another, another key uh, 
training topic would be strain conditioning for shipment and storage. You want to think about short-term storage. You want to think about long-term storage. You don't want to um, compromise the viability of your control strains. You don't want to compromise the viability of a strain that you might be sending to a uh, national reference lab or an international reference lab for subsequent sequencing or, or subsequent testing. Um, and then the identification methods for toxigenic Vibrio cholerae O1 and O139. And this is both culture-based methodology, the slide agglutination uh, in VC specific antisera and molecular methods. And we could, you know, we've been talking a lot about PCR, so we definitely want to cover that. Um, and potentially whole genome sequencing. We've, we've talked a little bit about that as well. Um, also antimicrobial susceptibility testing, uh, how to perform the test, how to interpret the results, the, important of the importance of control strains. Um, and and the fi finally, the last key topic we are proposing is data management and reporting laboratory results. And this is all about consistency and, and it mitigates, potentially can mitigate some of that downstream uh, 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 merging of laboratory and epi data that we often hear about. So think about, are these the key topics or are there more key topics that should be included in a laboratory training package? So then the next um, item is who should be trained? We've already, already kind of talked about this. The target audience depends on the topic of interest. And you might want to consider a broader audience or other stakeholders in certain circumstances. So on the left-hand side, you'll see three different categories. Um, we're calling them healthcare workers. So that could be your technicians, your clinicians, your nurses, uh, your surveillance officers, the, the people who go out in the field, the people who are, yeah, the people who are doing field investigations. Um, that sort of thing. And then your laboratory staff, of course. And then going across across the table, you'll see some of the topics we just talked about on the other slide. So for the cholera basics, you might want to include all of those, all of those people in that kind of a training. Um, for specimen collection, preservation, and transport, again, you might want to include all of those people in this kind of training, especially those uh, surveillance teams that are going out there and doing those field investigations. Why, why are you not including them in that kind of training when they are the people who do that sample collection for in those circumstances? Uh, the adaptive testing strategy, again, mainly for awareness. You know, you want the clinicians to know how many samples to collect and how many samples to to send into the reference laboratory for, um, for testing. I've seen um, a lot recently where I, I, you know, testing is great, but you don't need to confirm 90% of the samples, the suspected samples, that, that is resource intensive for the laboratory, both, you know, the, the consumables and time, the, these laboratories are doing much more than cholera. So being mindful of that. Um, the RDTs here again, I think this is applicable across the board. Um, when it comes to test methods, now here, if it's the hands-on piece, like I said, that might be best for laboratory staff, but if it's really, if you're sharing contextual information, you might you might consider others, other uh, other players, other stakeholders uh, to be included in that lecture. Um, and finally, reporting lab results. Again, I uh, suggest uh, only laboratory staff, but you know it's never bad to to include the other stakeholders because it promotes awareness and the in the and and better communication and more awareness only makes your whole network and response network work better. But think about some other stakeholders that you might want to include uh, in these laboratory trainings. 
So how to structure the training? We're proposing a tiered program. So tier one would be the basics, specimen collection. Well, so the, the disease, the pathogen, what a res uh, effective cholera response, uh, specimen collection, preservation and transport, RDTs, isolation, the, and, and really we're talking about culture-based methods for this tier one. And then tier two, you're advancing a little bit. Adapt, adaptive testing strategy, reporting laboratory results, AST, PCR. You can see how it's getting a little more complicated as you progress through the tiers. And then tier three would be something like whole genome sequencing. So think about this. Would you, would you maybe think there would be a rearrangement in this structure? Would you think other topics should be in different tiers? Um, or there, or do you uh, want to propose an alternative option for, for structuring a training plan? So there are different uh, modes of deliveries and formats for training. It can be in person, it can be virtual. It can be on site in your people come to your laboratory and do the training or another laboratory could host a workshop and could invite multiple people from multiple laboratories to that workshop and do training. It could be on demand on your time. You just go online and, and do a grab what you need and do this virtual training. Um, Again, it can be hands-on, it can be lecture-based. And, and training can also be internally led. You know, it can be planned within your laboratory or within your laboratory network, or you could invite a partner in an external training. Um, so many different ways to, of delivery. So what to think about here and what we're interested in hearing is what would work best for your laboratory and your laboratory network. So and this is a very important topic, topic, and that's validating the training. And measuring the success of the training is a crucial part of the capacity building program. So you need to know how effective was the training? You know, when you're training, you're like, I know what I'm doing. This is great. How can they not understand this? You can't, you don't know that. You, you have to assess how, how the participants picked up what you were, what you were trying to get across. Um, what did the participants learn? And when you're trying to validate um, a tier training program, one of the things you want to think about is that stepwise certification at the end of each tier. And there, there has to be some sort of like a, a gate, if you will. And you, you don't progress to the next tier until you have mastered the, the skills or the techniques or the topics in that first tier. So here are some ways that you can do this validation. If it's a lecture-based training, and what whether this is in person, virtual, or online, you could do a pre-test or a post-test or, or both. You have a set of 25 questions that participants take at the beginning of the program. And then you have that same set of 25 questions at the end of the program, and you can measure in real time the improvement from, from one point to another. And we do this pretty often when we do uh, trainings, and it's, it's always very gratifying when you see scores go from, say, 15 to an average 15, 16 to, you know, 23, 24. It's, it's very gratifying. And you want to give that score in real time and feedback in real time. If there were still some questions that a lot of people got wrong, you want to tell them what was wrong and, and, and go over it to, to try to fix that in, um, 
get them into that understanding uh, during the training, when you still have that opportunity to have a conversation about it. Um, and then for hands-on training, one thing you can do after that is have an external quality, you could, you could do external quality assurance. And this is a technical partner or maybe an EQA provider uh, usually sending a blinded panel for identification. Uh, the laboratory works it up in the using their normal workflow. And it these, these uh, EQA panels usually come with standardized reporting forms and instructions and a due date. Um, and then if it's an accredited EQA, an accredited provider, a, a real proficiency testing provider, they uh, may include a score, you know, you, you whatever, 80% correct, 90% correct, uh, something like that. So we've done it in one or two countries. We've done it with Haiti and they, they did great, but we're not an accredited PT provider. So we just, we, we, we say, we, we give an overall score for how many laboratories participated and we'll say something, we, we are very detailed in the feedback, like you got this absolutely correct, or the, the, here's where you went astray, or we would say, we, we look at things, not only the final result, but the way you recorded the final result. So it, it's, it's a great opportunity to really um, fine tune those skills. And then uh, another great way after training is to do a post-training competency assessment. And this can be organized internally. It's customizable. So not only are you looking at, did they get the answer right? But you have an opportunity to inclu include more elements in these sort of internally, or internally organized post-training competency assessments. You can observe them, you can observe their technique you can observe how they use the instrument. Are they using it correctly? Are they loading it correctly? Um, are they recording information correctly? These uh, internal competency assessments um, are a great tool. We use them in our laboratories. And, and if, I've, if I've done training, I always try to take a few minutes to go over to go over this with the quality manager or the lead of the bacteriology lab and give them some ideas how to how to do this periodically to not only assess after the training but you know at uh, at specific periods of time to it helps to maintain that competence so i don't know how did did i do okay on time okay awesome Okay, so now we can talk about those questions. Uh, so here they all are. They were they were up on the screen while I was showing the slides. You know, we don't have to go in order. What else can the GTFCC do to support training? What did you think about those key topics? Did we miss anything? Uh, do you think there are other stakeholders we should include? What are your thoughts on the tiered training program? Are there other considerations or alternative options? And what is what mode of delivery or format will work best for you? Yes. Oh, awesome. Do you want to start? Uh, we want to start with the two people online. Oh, okay. All right. Um, I'll, we leave the floor to Fred for your comments and then Chloe. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for this presentation. I, I, I put up my hand when we were talking about the topics uh, to discuss about. And uh, one of these topics are to uh, relate with uh, uh, training on RDT use. I think I want to reinforce that point because in the course of this um, 
of the deliberations uh, from, I think, yesterday, today, I have gathered some sentiments that the RDTs are really field-based uh, tests, and uh, so they are not uh, uh, the concern of the laboratory. And pardon me if I am wrong in, uh, in my uh, perception of the sentiments, but I, I think otherwise, because in general, uh, and, and based on the experience from some of the field colleagues from some of the countries, we 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 gather that the rapid response teams and and in some instances when it comes to testing and in the field they would ask the lab people there to do the testing uh, using the RDTs. That, that will be the first instance. But also looking at the fact that when we talk about the upstream workflow, you would essentially do the rapid testing to do the screening, and then you go to, you select the positives to do culture on, for example. If you do not do the rapid testing correctly, if the persons that do the rapid testing correctly do, do not do it correctly, whether they're rapid response teams and so on, then you will either have no or fewer samples to do culture and you may give a false impression. Or you will have so many false positives coming through, you use more uh, cultural resources for confirmation, which is in itself a loss. So I, I want to reinforce the conversation that the rapid diagnostic kits, even though are field-based things, the lab needs to take stewardship in capacity building, even if it includes spot checks for people who may be rapid response team people or who may be lab people. I think the lab needs to take stewardship in building If resources, the rapid test. So uh, I just wanted to add my voice to that and uh, share my feelings about 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 uh, that. Thank you, uh, and back. To Thank you for that comment, Fred. I uh, appreciate um, the recognition that la um and and I'm in agreement that that laboratory stewardship uh for RDTs is is a good choice um we promote the idea of when new kits or new lots of kits are received in the laboratory do a quality check and you know maybe maybe use one or two tests have a positive and a negative and just ensure that it makes it works the way it's supposed to before they're set out into the field, sent out into the field. You don't know, you assume the shipping conditions or the shipping temperatures were within the manufacturer's uh, recommended range, um, but you don't know that for sure. And it's, it's, it's a nice uh, way to check it's it's an easy way to check too that the test are still the integrity hasn't been compromised by some sort of uh, fluctuation a uh, long term long term exposure to higher than ideal temperatures. Most of the kits can take some like a very short window outside that uh, recommended temperature range, but it that's kind of vague. Uh, short term exposure outside the. Uh, slightly outside the recommended temperature range is short term 30 minutes is short term two hours is outside the recommended temperature range two degrees 10 degrees so so um uh affording the laboratory an opportunity to do that um quality check uh is is something we promote internally thanks a lot fred and nadia you said there was another question I invite 
Chloe Hutchins. Hi, thank you for that, that fantastic talk and all of them for today. My name is Chloe. I'm, I'm from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, um, working in primarily in Uvira in the DRC, but also with the uh, Goma and Lubumbashi labs. Um, I just wanted to add, uh, you, you asked the question, um, and one thing that I would add into that very comprehensive um, training package is I would absolutely add in um, a presentation on its own just on safety, biosafety, chemical safety, because you're training a real mix of backgrounds and even within the same institution, even if they've all come up through the same university, they will have a different appreciation and experience with safe handling of everything they're doing in the laboratory. Um, additionally, safety tends to be quite dry. <laughs> and so people don't, uh, they, they, it's very easy to switch off. So what I would suggest is what I, I think you're already doing is sprinkling safety reminders throughout your training, but definitely having a core training presentation. Um, kind of complementary to what Fred has said, I, I think I, I had kind of suggested that the, the RDT training and surveillance sample collection, et cetera, might be a good idea to either put in one section or a separate tier. Um, I agree that it is very important that the lab teams should be able to run RDTs, especially with an example of GOMA, where you have that as a central laboratory for cholera testing. And normally RDTs would be done and then the sample sent, but now there is an outbreak in GOMA. And so that lab is having to do them straight away. So of course that's very important, but tendon, uh, the laboratory staff are not likely to be involved in collecting the stool samples themselves, et cetera. So it might be a good idea to package that um, ever so slightly separately or just keeping it together. Um, I think that's the bulk of it for, for Marion's talk. I've kind of been, apologies for the number of comments in the chat. Um, and I think the other ones are uh, for previous presentations. So I, I will leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chloe. Well noted on that biosafety and biosecurity. Um, is my boss still in the room? Maybe she no she didn't notice that I left that out. Oops. Um, but no, it's definitely very important to include and, and well noted on all the other comments. Thank you. I see a couple of questions in the room as well. I'll just go in order. Uh, Af Afghanistan, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think we all agree on the integration of uh, love with the surveillance, which is much, much needed. And here I see the, the topic of this session is a vision for the laboratory training. Uh, while having these uh, online materials, e-learning, short courses, uh, some uh, uh, short duration course in presence is, is very good idea and it's very useful and effective. Uh, but I believe uh, since we are talking about the vision and given the need in the capacity of the countries, it will be very, very useful and recommended to have some long-term training program uh, like as we have in FETP for epidemiology, but we don't, we are missing the, the lab part of that FETP and uh, a collaboration between CDC and GTFTC and some uh, other institution uh, who could provide the fund uh, would be a good idea. For example, in, in case of my country, uh, if we have CPHL and five or six regional reference labs, and if we train uh, an intermediate uh, uh, duration of one or two years, a virologist or a bacteriologist or, or a lab um, person, that will be of 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 the of the very useful uh, resource for for the countries like Afghanistan. Thank you. This is just a recommendation. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that touches on mentorship. You know, when you do training, you don't go in, train, and then see ya. You know, it, if you want sustainability, you want long-term engagement and mentorship. So I really appreciate that comment. Uh, thank you. Okay, going back, I think, uh, Kenya or no, it was Uganda. And I don't have everybody's names memorized yet. I know I met all you guys. I'll, I'll get the names right. But was it? So Kenya. Uh, thank you so much. This is Sauda from Uganda. 
Uh, thank you for the wonderfully uh, structured uh, module presentation. Uh, just a few comments, uh, just to overly emphasize the issue of biosafety, biosecurity in the clinical world, we might as well call it the infection prevention and control, especially in situations where RDTs are being uh, used as field or rapid response uh, kits, that is very important. And still on that, the internal quality controls are very key, especially when RDTs are being deployed, because uh, people can just use them in how. Then the second is including the data people. I know many times surveillance and data are one and the same, but in the facilities, for example, in my country, the data people are entirely different and you want to be able to, to be sure that the reporting indicators are well understood by everyone. And then also uh, to overemphasize, I think in all aspects, probably the nomenclature of the training being laboratory training might be biasing, but I feel in all tracks, we should include the clinicians and the nurses. Reason being, you find that many times if you're going to do culture, the diagnostic stewardship and the pre-analytical quality of the sample solidly depends on the clinician and the nurse who is collecting the sample many times. But also when you look at the experience that Uganda just had for Ebola, who are wondering how did we miss a VHF outbreak for so long? And why is that? It is because the clinician's mindset, the clinician okay, knows and says, well, I've been seeing so many people who are bleeding, but I didn't think it was uh, Ebola. I didn't know the right sample to be taken off. So if you can have the clinicians right from the word go, they know the right sample to collect, how to collect it, when and how to transport it. That is very okay. And then lastly, we can include the echo module in the training, the virtual. The echo modules are, are, are in a good experience. The people who have tried them, the TB has done it. We are, they are piloting one in AMR, that is the teach it AMS. I think even in cholera, it can be a good one, especially when we don't have the opportunity for face-to-face -face trainings. We can also adopt this strategy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very, very well noted. And, um, you know, I do think given the, the many uh, challenges to doing in-person training, given the cost or humanitarian crises, having these sort of virtual um, training opportunities on a specific subject over a course of time is is something we should certainly explore. I, I appreciate your comments. Thank you very much. Was there another one? Was it uh, okay? okay. Uh, right behind Katia? All right, good morning. I'm Shola from, from Nigeria. So I just have a few comments. So um, on, on the third, training so i wanted to suggest that um so the different models are quite okay but um, that one shouldn't be um exactly prerequisite for the next one um that's because um for for example in 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 my laboratory for example where we have different units take care of different things if you if one the first one for example is a prerequisite for the next one yeah, so I, I like when it gets to the molecular aspects of the NGS and all that. So for people that are in core genomics, they wouldn't want to, they, they don't, the training might not be. So I'm just saying that, yeah, for some levels, it might be um, prerequisite, but I think it will also be open that um, um, based on your level of, ex of experience, you can actually hope to start from wherever you think it's applicable to to you um then also i also want to agree with um previous speakers about um how did you use and in the fields because um for us i know that even our rapid response team is always composed of um, different um classes of professionals and we always have laboratory teams i mean laboratory um personnel fall in on every hierarchy um going to the field so it's it's important that um so they they actually do most even the rdt testing whenever even in outbreaks we have uh, members of 
different laboratories pulled out to support um, response during during outbreaks. Yeah, then also um, I want to also wanted to um, have that, but I think somebody already mentioned it's quality assurance at um, every level, um, at each of the levels of uh, um, the, the different trainings. Yeah, so, um, okay, yes, I've already, biosafety quality assurance, those are the things I noted and I think those have been um, already mentioned. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. I do see a few other hands, but we might need to, we can follow up uh, over lunch, catch me at any point, you know I talk. So just grab me. Um, but I want what I want would like to do is is hand it over to Philippe, maybe say a few words about uh, this presentation and uh, before moving on. There you go, thank boss. You. No, no, you stay here. Oh. Uh, no, so so thank you very much. I think it's very clear. Uh, uh, a, a number of the point that I want to mention has been alluded to in a very diplomatic way. I'm not going to be diplomatic. Uh, <laughs> Um, well, I like very much the word, uh, you know, stewardship, but there is another one that I want to, to, to bring back is ownership. Forget, don't forget, never forget that the clinician, most of the time, not all of them, they have no clue of what the lab result is, positive, negative, and, okay, so you, as lab people, you are in charge, you are responsible in both ways, but you are the one who are in charge of telling guy, you know, first, how to interpret a result. And this is something that, you know, I mean, RDT is a very good example. RDT is not a lab confirmation test. It's a screening test. We don't use RDT for clinical management, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Another thing that, uh, uh, again, I know it's alluded to, huh? so it's not a critique, but <laughs> in terms of data, how many times have you seen sample coming with uh, stupid numbers or sometimes no numbers or no bloody information about what it is? How can you interpret the result if you don't have that? Okay, basic information, you know, name, age, sex, uh, whether patient D took antibiotic before, yes or no, or I don't know. I don't know is an answer. Fine, but at least you cannot interpret the result if you don't have vaccination. You know, people that have been vaccinated a few days before uh, having the test, it's very likely that the edit is going to be positive. <laughs> you know, so this is your role. So you must be empowered also to say, no, I want to have this information. I've never, I never see, or I mean, I'm not saying that they are not there, but you know, what are the proportion of samples that are coming to the lab in good condition? That means the definition. With uh, one of the challenge of the, the, the rectal swab, there are many advantages, but the problem with the rectal swab, we don't even know uh, if you know if it's uh, you know really meeting the case definition. I'm sure you have seen it. You know, cholera sample in a pot where. So this tool is like that, uh, cholera, acute, what are you, diarrhea. This does not meet the case definition, no. Nope. So the thing is, I really want to give you the message again. You are not just a service provider, you are the expert. Put yourself in the expert position. You are entitled to ask people, no, I need to have this information and the interpretation is with you. So you are partner of the of the response. The uh, same, I mean, I've seen, and after I stop, but you know, I I, I could have twenty uh, story about that. Okay, you know, people, uh, you know, looking for cholera, vibrio cholera. Oh, using PCR. Okay, it's positive. Okay, which PCR? So people say, oh, we have cholera. No, you have vibrio cholera. It's not cholera because you know it's it stop at the species. So there is no serogrouping, no serotyping. So we don't know what it is. Or you have PCR, that does not mean that uh, it's a life. You have genetic material. So you are key. 
You are not just a partner, you are not just a, a service provider, you are key, you are the expert. This is your responsibility to bring people and to have them respecting you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So just I'll just recap. I, I think we have some great ideas. You know, we definitely uh, uh, want to consider the biosafety and biosecurity the standard data that needs to come along with sample collection, the standardized way to report out uh, results, findings from multiple laboratory tests, uh, considering those uh, the RDT, the broad audience, the laboratory stewardship, a lot of great suggestions. Thank you. Thank you very much for all of your feedback. And uh, I look forward to uh, starting to work with you all on the development of this training package. Thank you.